When I think about what we started last week, Christian identity is a wonderful truth in the life of a child of God. And I want us to begin, we're going to be in Romans tonight, but I want us to begin in Philippians chapter number 3 to start out. And I want to introduce tonight's message, and this is the second part in the teaching of this particular series that I felt strongly to be able to share because today in our culture there's a lot that people go off on, and when I think about what as believers, our our relationship to the Lord is so meaningful, and it and it it is far superior than what uh, maybe we might not know about at the beginning. So we're going to look at Philippians. Paul wrote uh, much of the book of Philippians, if not all of the book of Philippians. But in Philippians chapter number three, uh, this beginning of the chapter gives to us, I think, something very important. We'll begin. In verse number, let's get the context of what he's saying in beginning with verse number one. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you, to me indeed. It's not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh. I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But all what but what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. Now this is an amazing statement. May I summarize just a little bit of it? What Paul used to hold high in esteem in regards to his salvation now has taken a back seat because he is a new creation in Christ. He actually was led by the Spirit of God to identify all believers as new creations in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And so in his former life, there was a lot of exterior things such as circumcision, such as trying to keep the law, which no man could do, by the way. And just the fact that he lists being Uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrew. But all those things concerning his relationship to Jesus, he counts them but done. They're not as important to him as they once were. Why? Because Christ offers salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. And so as we go through some things found mainly, primarily in the book of Romans, I want to encourage you that These truths can be a truth of your life as well. So we're going to begin in Romans chapter number one. We're glad that you're able to be here this evening. And before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that are ours in you. We thank you that you offer us salvation, forgiveness of sin so freely through a relationship in yourself. Thank you for your love and thank you for a good day. We pray now that the Holy Spirit will use the truth of your word to equip us, Lord, to comfort and to encourage us. Lord, when a time there is so much confusion about what, uh, Lord, the world tells us we should be inspired to be, thank you that through a relationship in you, we can, Lord, have purpose and Lord, we can have hope for the future. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts now and I pray you'll save that one that is not saved and Lord, that your will be done. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I used to have a professor in college who used to say, I wish to God that someone would come up with an instrument where we all we could do is kind of like uh, zap our students and then, and then we would know whether or not they're a child of God. <laughs> all around us there are people that claim to be Christians and, and the marks of Christianity are broad because you can have people that like in Paul's day or Jesus' day that have emphasized externals, but where does God look? God looks upon the heart. The evidence of a true believer is the fruits of a believer. Jesus said this, by their fruits you shall know them. And so as we look at some of these truths tonight, there are some 
thoughts I want to take from the book of Romans. Paul wrote the book of Romans that all, I believe all these are benefits of a relationship with God in a vertical wise. That is in our relationship to God, our Heavenly Father. The first one is found in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 9. Who are you in Christ Jesus? Well, first of all, we are justified. That is, declare righteous. And how am I declare righteous? Because we've said this before that not all Christians are perfect. Uh, there's not a just man upon the earth that do good and sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, there's nobody that lives a life perfectly on planet earth. But look what Paul wrote in Romans 5 verse number 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood. This is referring to the blood of Christ. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So justification is a legal term. To be clear righteous by God Almighty, not based on human merit, based on the fact that his only son shed his innocent, sinless blood. Now this is a marvelous truth to contemplate. Because all men are going to die, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 tells us. And for those that are outside of Christ, that is outside of a relationship with God's only Son, there's wrath to deal with. And so the blood of Christ causes me to be declared innocent, forgiven, righteous in His sight. That is justified just as though I've never sinned before Almighty God. We know the reality. As believers, we know that we're not perfect, but because of our relationship to Jesus in Christ, we are declared righteous. Secondly, I am reconciled through Christ. In Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 10, going further down in this chapter, it says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, that's Jesus, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. Now, there is a contrast here. Before I was restored, that's what the word reconcile means. It means to be restored. Bro There's something that's been broken. Sin has broken the relationship between us and God. And God has stated in his word that he is angry with the wicked every day. The enemies across are plenty. We, as we are studying in the book of Luke, we are reminded that Jesus had his enemies. And those enemies wanted him crucified. And Christ, because of his mercy and love demonstrated on the cross of Calvary, not only are we justified, but now we are reconciled. We are restored to God. We can have communion with God our Father. We can have fellowship with him 24-7. And to me, this is a tremendous spiritual benefit that only Christ could grant us and that we can have through Christ Jesus. So this is amazing. Thirdly, let's go further in the book of Romans. Not only am I justified and I am reconciled, but thirdly, I am free from sin and I'm slave to righteousness. Now, Paul, Paul uses the word servant in the book of Romans, which also is translated dumas or slave here. But let's begin in verse number 9 of Romans chapter 6. He says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now when we read this chapter, and I would encourage you to read it fully, if Christ is our Savior, we now have received the Holy Spirit of God, and because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us, now we have the power as believers, as children of God, to not allow sin to rule and reign over us. Sin no more has to have dominion over us. And so now we are not shackles. We are not bound to the sinful lifestyle because of the resurrected Lord and His Holy Spirit living inside of us. Christian identity is marked by the fact that now I have liberty in Christ. 
Now I don't have to be bound and dragged by my sin continually. I can be free from the power of sin. Skip down to verse number 18. And Paul makes this statement, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness, or the slaves of righteousness. When we receive the Lord as our Savior, we receive a new nature. And that new nature is the Holy Spirit of promise. We're sealed under the day of redemption. We mentioned that last Sunday in our first message of our Christian identity. That the Holy Spirit has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. And Paul makes an emphasis here in Romans chapter number 6 that we are now free from sin. And now we can yield our lives to God's direction in our life and His will and His truth. And now we can be servants, slave to the righteousness of God. And this to me is a big difference. As a child of God, I want to do what's right. Often I don't because I have the own nature and I need to decide which nature I'm going to yield to. If I yield to the new nature, then my life will bring forth the evidence of righteousness in my daily walk with Him. I'm no longer under the law of God. I'm under grace. So Christian identity then is marked by a changed lifestyle. It's a process of spiritual growth and sanctification as I allow and I learn to yield myself to the will of God as spoken of in Scripture. Then I become more, I would say, freer in a sense to the things that used to hold me bondage. For example, if I am free in Christ, then lying will be part of that, maybe that old part of my life. The Bible says all men are liars. And uh, we've broken the commands of God, the laws of God. And so if I am free in Christ, then I don't want to yield my life to a life of uh, falsehood. I want to live my life to a sense of integrity and uprightness and honesty. Here's another blessing that we can glean from Paul's writing in the book of Romans. Not only am I justified, I am reconciled, I am free from sin, and I now can yield my life to his righteousness, or, and I can be a servant of righteousness, but number four, I am free from condemnation. This is in Romans chapter number eight. One of the blessings that we get to uh, enjoy as believers is that Judgment, the wrath of God has now been taken off our life because of Christ Jesus. And Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation which to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now think about this. It took me a while to really... Uh, I, I guess I would say cement this, that there is never going to be a time in my life that I'm going to be condemned for any wrong thing that I've ever done in my life. That as believers, I will not be judged and sentenced to hell. Christ already took that judgment for me. And for our unsaved friends and for those that are still condemned, t contemplating whether or not they should put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ Today is all we have. I want us to take a, take a moment and go to John chapter 3 for a moment. In John chapter 3, the whole human race is under the old sin nature. And uh, there's a, a day appointed. It's appointed unto man once to die. And according to Hebrews 9, 27, then the judgment comes. What will men be judged for? Well, in John chapter number 3, after speaking to, to the most religious leader, I would say of Jesus' day, or one of them, Nicodemus, Jesus goes into a dialogue with him about being born again, and then he talks about how the sun must be lifted up, even as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. And he highlights John 3.16, but following this, in John 3.17, Jesus said this, for God sent not his son into the world to what? To condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the purpose of Jesus not necessarily to come into the world to condemn the world. But notice what verse 18 tells us. He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation. What is this, the condemnation? That light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. All started with uh, Adam, unfortunately, in the Garden of Eden when he disobeyed God. When God came in that garden and looked for Adam, Adam was afraid and he hid from the Lord. And light was present in the Garden of Eden. From that day to this, men would rather yield to darkness. Darkness representing a life of disobedience. Darkness representing uh, evil. And so John is, is reminding us of something that has come upon all men. Men would rather do evil than do right. Why is that? Because we've all received a sinful nature. So there's condemnation upon the whole generations of men. Until one man entered into history and time, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has pronounced that there is therefore now no condemnation. That is for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so this is one of the comforting things that we can sing hallelujah and praise the Lord for, that I'm no longer condemned. I'm under the grace of God. I've been forgiven. I've been declared righteous. My sins have been blotted out, as Isaiah the prophet mentions. And, and so part of what Paul makes here, he doesn't get people off the hook. A lot of people say, I believe in God. A lot of people say, oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. But notice what he says here in verse 1. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What is the proof of the Christian life? That you're a child of God. What's the proof that you're saved? It should be changed behavior, right? Now, notice I didn't say perfect behavior. <laughs> because we are what we are by the grace of God. And Christians are still capable of sinning. But reverting back to Romans 6, I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer in bondage. I have freedom because of my Lord and because of my Savior. And that's good news for God's people. Number five, let's go a little bit further in this chapter. And this is just a little re, re, uh, re repetition of what we've mentioned. But I am free in Christ in this relation. In verse number two, he says, For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, have made me free, don't miss this, from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death, by the way? Let's talk about the law of sin. The law of sin teaches us that all men have done something wrong. The law of sin teaches us that there's not a just man upon the earth that do a good and sin it not. The law of sin teaches us that we've broken the laws of the Ten Commandments. I try to do right, but I haven't kept all ten and no one has. All have violated the law of God. The law of sin says the soul that sin it, the, the soul that breaks the law of God will what? Die. And the soul that sin it sh shall be separated from God. That's what death is. Death is separation from God Almighty forever. And this is what Revelation 21, 8 is about when it talks about death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There is eternal separation um, still yet to come for those who have not trusted Christ as Savior. The law of sin has me bound here on earth. Uh, I'm not going to live immortal here on earth. I know there's movies like The Walking Dead, but the truth of the matter is you're going to die one day. I'm going to die if the Lord doesn't rapture the church out in our present time. The law of sin says, I'm going to grow older, not younger. I'm going to grow weaker. Thank God for good health. Thank God for uh, medications. Thank God for uh, treatment that can help us get back on the road. But I'm going to pass off one day, and so are you. And I'm not going to live forever in this mortal body. And then my body will be buried. I'll go six feet under maybe. And, um, and uh, I got a bunch of pillows in my house. My wife says, you get too many pillows, Byron. I, I wear them out, I flatten them out. I said, well, when I die, just throw all my pillows in the grave, you know. <laughs> I know they're not going to go anywhere, but you can get rid of them there. And uh, my spirit, however, will live forever. 
The law of sin only takes me to the grave, and thank God it ends there. It doesn't go any further. But God, thank God for His mercy and grace. The law of the spirit of life now kicks in, and now I have something far greater that I never thought I would contemplate, and that is I'm alive for more than ever. I'm in the presence of Jesus. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Christians are never separated from God ever in their life. And that's what Paul makes a statement in this same chapter in Romans chapter number 8. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. I am free in Christ Jesus. And all God's people can say, praise God for that. Amen. I am free. Now there are a lot of people in the world that are not free. There's a lot of people in the world that are tied to a certain culture, tied to a certain identity because, think about China. In that country, they're only the women folks, I'm told, and, and this has part of been the historic uh, narrative that if you're going to have family, for the most part, Chinese are only allowed to have one kid. That's it. Sometimes, maybe two, maybe others get away with that. Here in this country, that's not our issue. But in this country, we have our own issues here in our, our United States of America. You know, keeping up with the Joneses. Joneses, neighbor gets a new truck. This neighbor over here feels they got to get a new truck. This student over here gets a new dress. This student over here feels there's competition. There's a sort of another bondage that our culture derives on. The grass is always greener on the other side till you go on the other side and you find they got weeds. You find they got thorns. It's not what it's cut out to be. A culture of clashes and certainly identity. And, um, you know, people don't know if that's a guy or that's a girl today. A man and a woman. The, the, the gender issue is all confused. In Christ Jesus, God clears up so much. Because in Christ, we are complete in Him. I am free. I am free from the peer pressure. I am free from what I have to formally compete against. I am free from, I don't know if you've ever smoked cigarettes. I have in the past, believe it or not. Man, those little, that little park, that little package right there has a lot of people in bondage. And I thought I could break away from that and found myself having to labor. And thank God through Christ, I was able to uh, say adios to that habit years ago, years ago. Let's move on. Number six, I am a child of God and I join heir in Christ. This is another Christian identity. Look in Romans chapter number eight, verse 17. And if children, he's going along the same statement, if you've been risen with Christ, if you're led by the Spirit of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we have suffered with him, that we may also glorify together, that we may be also glorified together. The best is yet to come. As a child of God, we can say, And we can sing the song, this world is not my home, I'm only passing through. But think about this, everything that God owns is part of your heritage. In the heavenlies, in heaven, uh, we're going to have full access to that. Now while we're here on earth, we have access to God. We're still children of God. We are a child of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. Hopefully His truths are part of our lives. Hopefully we've seen a change in our life when we are promised by God Himself, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Is it true if you are a joint heir that there are certain riches that are part of ours? Such as, let's say, the peace of God. The peace of God which passes all understanding. How about the joy of the Lord? A lot of people have to drink a six-pack, have to go out and party in order to be happy, have to watch something on television before they can be content. Through Christ Jesus, we have so much blessings. Part of the eternal riches that are ours are certainly connected in a relationship to our Lord. One day we will be glorified together. We'll see the Lord Jesus in his glorified body. And we likewise will be in a glorified body that will never get hungry, that will never get tired, and we'll be together forever with our Lord in glory. I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Christ. 
the blessings that God has um, in store for me are rightfully mine through a relationship through Christ, peace of God, the joy of the Lord, and so forth, the Holy Spirit. But that's not all. I am more than a conqueror in Romans chapter number 8, and we're almost done with this, and I'm just barely skimming these highlights. We'll go back perhaps to some of them, as I mentioned even last week. In verse 37 of Romans 8, Paul says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, I've never seen myself as a conqueror, but what is he talking about? What is Paul referring to here as a conqueror? Someone that's victorious. Someone that overcomes. Someone that is able to go against great odds. In this case, there are trials and tribulations and persecution and peril and for famine and sword. And yet still make it through, if God wills, with our heads up, recognizing it was all because of Christ Jesus. Paul said it like this in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then he later on says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember the statement by Jesus, by those who believe on him. When we die, we want to hear those words, Enter thou in the joy of the Lord, thou good and faithful servant. We can, with the help of God, conquer. We can be victorious. We can overcome the things of this life. Lastly, I am accepted through Christ. I am accepted. And we've begun this message by saying there's a lot of things that people have to do in order to be accepted by various organizations and clubs and even our own society here in our country. If you drive an old beat-up car, chances are you're going to be made fun of. You're going to be criticized maybe, but if it works, <laughs> hallelujah, amen. Uh, the car that works, thank God for that. That's all To me, that's more important than sometimes in the style and so forth. But in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 7, Paul makes a statement, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God of God. We are accepted in this family of God because of Christ. Now I mentioned earlier and maybe mentioned it even in this morning's message. One of the great things about the Christian life is that my identity is so much not so wrapped up in the color of my hair, my skin, maybe even the country that I come from or how much money I make or what kind of car I drive or what kind of a house I live in or clothes I wear, but my Christian identity is made up as, do I belong to Jesus Christ? Do I know him? Do you know him? And my concern for anyone is that my identity as a believer is found in a relationship. And that relationship is found in one that's willing to receive anyone who's willing to believe on Jesus. In John chapter number 1, unfortunately, the commentary that John writes is that he came unto his own and his own received them not. Jesus had already made up his mind he's willing to receive him, but many people refuse to receive Jesus. In other words, God is not going to force you to believe on him. God has given you a free will. I don't understand it all, but God works in a sovereign way to bring the good news to humanity, and God works with our choices. And many tonight have still yet have put their faith and trust in Jesus. He's willing to receive us with all of our luggage, with all of our habits. And through him, we can be forgiven. Through him, we can be saved. Through him, we can have a new identity and an identity in Christ. The challenge for us found in this verse, did you notice here in Romans 15, 7? Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So when we think about our, our neighbors, friends, Christians in general, 
How can I receive others? Well, the way Christ received me. He received me. Did I have to pass any tests? <laughs> he was very gracious and uh, very loving. And uh, I'm so thankful that Christ was willing to receive us. Does that mean we accept everybody? Well, I'll, I'll give you this one thought. God's willing to be, be gracious to us, to accept us with all our sin habits. When it comes to accepting one another, God gives us discernment. And I believe he's talking about there, there were believers in that early New Testament church that later on when Christ would ascend up into glory, they would come among them and some would not be genuine. Some of them would actually turn against them and some would try to destroy the very work of God. And so we can use discernment as we live out our lives as believers. Christian identity in Christ is a wonderful, wonderful thing for all of us to experience. And so what I gave you tonight can be a reality that uh, I am justified, declared righteous. I am, praise the Lord, I'm accepted in his beloved. And every, every one of those truths that we looked at, I'm a joint heir. I am a uh, part of the family of God by faith in Him. And so there are many tonight that are still trying to figure out, who am I? What am I supposed to be living for? And God has a way of sharing with us through Christ and a relationship with Him of who God intended us to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You were willing to give Your life a ransom for all on the cross of Calvary. We thank You that in You that we have all the spiritual benefits of justification, reconciliation. And Lord, we think of the freedom that we have, freedom from the law of sin, and the, the privilege to be servants of righteousness. And Lord, how there's no condemnation whatsoever upon a child of God, how we are free in you. And Lord, how we are conquerors, victorious, overcomers. And Lord, because of what you've done for us, we can be accepted in the beloved. Oh God, I pray that you will use these truths to continue to comfort us, encourage us, inspire us to do whatever it is you want us to do in, the, in this week. And Father, we pray that we will not be ashamed of the gospel. We pray that you help us to share it with others as you, as you put us in contact with people this week. And Father, we'll thank you and we'll praise you. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen to that.